There's been lots of discussion and talks about CBD and hemp in general and how it's an emerging market, but there's really no data out there to, to speak of. And um, in trying to do an analysis of that market, I thought, well, if there's no data, then I'll just go out there and get the data myself. So I provided a survey um, to all of the growers of hemp, uh, all the licensed growers of hemp in the United States and um, got a really, really strong response. And originally, I wanted to just look at jobs data, like how many uh, part-time and full-time jobs, what are the wages like, um, because I had done some work um, for New Frontier Data out of Washington, D.C. We published a jobs and tax report uh, last year, and it got picked up by the Washington Post and all these other affiliates. But, um, but I'm sure that as I refresh it now, they're going to ask me what about the employment and wages for hemp. So I went out and gathered the data. Um, what I did not realize is just how fascinating the data would be. In addition to the number of full-time and part-time jobs, uh, people are actually getting a, a pretty decent wage uh, for this. But one of my questions talked about capacity in the market, how many acres or square feet that they were planting, also how much um, they're getting for their crop, and whether or not they had a buyer for their crop. And that's what was really intriguing because two-thirds of the respondents said that they didn't have a buyer for their crop. Now to put this in perspective, um, Oregon has roughly 60,000 acres that is licensed for hemp production uh, this year. Um, and if that's fully utilized, then that would be uh, 120 million pounds of biomass alone. Um, and based upon market prices right now, that would be over a $2 billion crop. Now, that would be the largest agricultural sector in Oregon. So it's gone from very low volume to very high volume very quickly. Um, but there's risks associated with that because if two thirds, if the averages hold for Oregon and two thirds of them don't have a buyer, then that means about you know, one and a half, one and three quarter um, billion dollars of supply doesn't have a home right now. Not only is there a lot of supply, but there's little hiccups in the supply chain. There's not enough drying capacity for the hemp once it's harvested. There's not enough processing capacity to convert the biomass into oil or CBD oil. And because there's those little hiccups in the supply chain, there's a lot of risks to that supply. And to me, that means risks to farmers and farmers' well-being. Even though there's been um, you know, policy um, indicators that say, hey, um, this is a legal crop, um, it's an agriculturally viable crop, um, uh, bankers are still um, stigmatizing hemp um, similar to the way that they have with cannabis, so the higher THC marijuana cannabis. And so banks are very, very reluctant right now to provide financing or banking services to the hemp industry. Um, and Senator Merkley mentioned this yesterday in his speech, and they're trying to do something about it at um, the U.S. congressional level, but right now there's a lot of differences between the bill being proposed in the House versus the bill that's acceptable in the Senate. Well, um, I think a lot of the surge in the supply and the number, the large number of, of um, producers in this space, um, they're planting those crops in anticipation of a payday at the end of the harvest season. Uh, I'm kind of doubtful that everybody's going to receive that payday. Um, not only are there risks in the supply chain, like I mentioned, risks in banking, but there's still a lot of of um, questions about what is the policy from the Food and Drug Administration or for the USDA. And so there's, will it be realized? Um, maybe eventually, but right now there's just a tremendous amount of risk. It's a diverse um, buyers group. Um, there's a lot of extractors that want to convert the, the biomass into the oils um, to support the CBD crave right now. Um, it's hugely popular. Some estimates put that at $5 billion. Other put it, the hemp industry in general, at $20 billion. So 
the demand is is wide ranging, um, but people are trying to capitalize on that. So the the processors are the ones that are entering into this, accumulating the biomass, converting it into oil, and then putting that into other products that will go into the retail system. Well, some say that there's 50,000 applications for industrial hemp, from fiber to plastics. Uh, BMW uses it in their car manufacturing. Uh, so does Subaru. There's hempcrete that's used in construction. But hemp is actually a kind of a superfood. And so I was recently speaking um, in Zimbabwe about industrial hemp and deploying industrial hemp in Africa. And the, the farmers in Zimbabwe right now don't get a lot of protein, they're malnourished. And so by introducing hemp-based foods into their food supply, they can become uh, better nourished and not have a lot of the health um, issues associated with malnourishment. So there's a lot of these benefits that people do not realize that goes way beyond just the CBD oils that's currently in, in vogue right now. I think the market in Oregon for industrial hemp is very, very robust um, because I have met a lot of folks that are trying to take the fibers and do something with that, with paper, for example. Um, and there's uh, talk of resurrecting a a uh, paper mill in Oregon City to devote it specifically for industrial hemp paper production. So there's a lot of economic activity swirling around associated with industrial hemp beyond just the oils. Um, but right now it's so nascent in its stages that a lot of those supply chain issues need to be ironed out. A lot of the regulatory issues need to be clarified. Um, but one thing that I've noticed in my analysis of the market is that there's a, um, a great infrastructure in terms of regulatory, academic, and um, industry support. There's a good cooperation going on right now. Oregon State is going out and helping hemp farmers with their crop to identify issues. The U.S. or the Oregon Department of Agriculture is partnering with the industry and with academia. So there's a really good uh, close system in Oregon that is really kind of a model for the rest of the country to follow. But I think it's important to understand um, what is the scale and scope of the industry, um, how far it's come in one year. Um, another data point, for example, if all of the biomass in the United States is realized and sold into the system, it would be 10% um, of all of the cash crops that sold in the United States. That's, 10 per, that's $195 billion total market. Um, hemp could be 20 to $40 billion of that. So it would be um, on par or slightly less than corn or wheat or soy. And so a lot of the farmers right now across the United States are talking how hemp is the fourth crop, the fourth big crop. And right now um, there have been uh, issues with the weather this, this winter, cold, a rainy and then a warm with the heat. Um, and so the output um, in the Midwest right now from an agricultural basis is really diminished. Um, less uh, corn, less wheat, less soy. And so farmers are looking at hemp as a way to uh, restore some of that lost revenue um, because uh, there's a much higher revenue poten potential per acre than for other of these agricultural products. Um, and one of the qualities of hemp is that the roots uh, are regenerative to the soil, and so it restores the soil, remediates all the impurities in the soil. Uh, they planted it at Chernobyl, for example, to take the uh, radioactivity out of the soil. Um, and then it also um, filters the air. So when there's carbon issues, it actually filters out more carbon on a per acre basis than an old growth forest. So there's all sorts of these um, environmental benefits and revenue benefits that big farmers are just now starting to appreciate and so they're converting some of their acreage over to hemp. So we um, sent to all the licensees direct in 18 states and then 12 other states our survey was deployed via the departments of agriculture in those states and the response rate we've got literally tens of thousands of acres of response. 
over 10 million square feet of greenhouse capacity. Um, and so it's a real robust, very kind of one of its kind um, data set right now that nobody else has or can even touch in the industry. Um, so um, we're producing a report. Um, Clarissa Allen, uh, who's a local economist, is teaming up with me. And we're producing a report that should come out in middle of September. So we're looking forward to helping establish a baseline for all the other economists and businesses um, around the country and around the world to build upon so that at least they have some information to make good policy and uh, investment and operational decisions on.